Bang, bang. What's going on, guys? Hope you guys are really excited about this interview. I really enjoyed it. I think you will as well. But before we get into that, make sure that you like this video so that more people on YouTube can find it. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel. And don't forget that BlockFi is the sponsor today. They've got three products you can buy and sell crypto on their crypto exchange. You can deposit crypto and earn up to 8.6% APY in an interest-bearing account, or you can deposit crypto and take out a US dollar loan against your crypto collateral. You can use the description right here, or you can go to blockfi.com slash pomp to learn more. All right, let's get into this episode. I hope you guys enjoy this one. All right, guys, bang, bang. I've got Wooter here with me. Thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Anthony. Really excited to be on. <laughs> all right, so I'm going to cheat. We're going to start off with a bang. Uh, if all of DeFi and decentralized financial applications, regardless of where they get built, if it all works, what does the world of finance look like? Like, what is the dream of all of this? So where, where I got so excited is, um, you know, my previous company that I built, uh, SecFi, which some of you will know, um, which raised a lot of money, $700 million in total, but in a completely centralized, you know, finance environment with all the transaction costs involved, including, you know, Swift wires that cost me 50, 50 bucks to make. Uh, I need to wait for Fedwire cutoff dates sometimes when we do options financing, like all these inefficiencies that we see in a centralized finance market. In a future where DeFi just drives a lot of these processes, I see a much more sort of frictionless environment where even you know you, me, Anthony, we can we can trade our shares if we want without a broker, intermediary, custodian for which we need to pay all these fees and many of these other applications that we see. That just gets me so exciting, just based on the world that I'm coming from. And I think that's really what uh, you know what I see as sort of uh, you know the real future uh, future looks like, if you ask me. For sure. And so when we start talking about decentralized uh, applications, um, is this something where you're thinking, hey, an entirely new world is going to get built and it's going to basically be the challengers uh, and it's going to be exclusive of the legacy players? Or do you see a world where those legacy players eventually are going to come in and uh, they're going to say, hey, we have to adopt the decentralized uh, applications and, and kind of play in this new world because that's where all the value is going to flow? So I think you have always two camps, right? You have the, the, sort of, the sort of crypto or DeFi purist that say, you know, DeFi will revolutionize the, the world of finance and will completely replace the existing system. I'm more of the camp that say, yes, some, some applications, you know, might be sort of completely replaced, but we also have to be realistic. Like governments are not standing still. You have organizations, even such as the SEC, that are increasingly looking at like, hey, how can these technology development be a benefit for us? How can we sort of help the, the market sort of regulate this and adopt this? And I would say that, you know, the, the decentralized technology can actually really also help centralized institutions or institutions that we have today just be more efficient, you know, reduce their cost of operating business and therefore in the end, reduce the cost that it, uh, that, that it costs consumers to access those products. And I think we will see there it's therefore like a blend where these technologies can also help, you know, some of the products that we see today in the market. Yeah. And it's fascinating talking to you about this because you built a very successful kind of centralized financial application, right? And a, a product in a company. And so talk a little bit just about uh, kind of the cognitive dissonance there, right? You, you were very successful building the centralized uh, entity. Now you're spending most of your time in the decentralized world. Uh, is it something where you're basically saying there's a, a binary winner take all system? Uh, or do you think that actually that centralized world will also still kind of coexist? Maybe it's not as popular. Maybe it doesn't uh, um, kind of die right away, but you know th there is some value still left there. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. You know what we build at Secfi for those that sort of don't know that are tuning in, uh, we we kind of pioneered the concept of providing financing based on private company assets. So we we helped a lot of people in the early days of Uber uh, exercise their stock options, got them the financing to pay for the taxes, and so on and so forth. But what we had to sort of develop from a central you know central finance point of view is we need to make sure that you know the, the shares can't go anywhere where we ha when we have the financing. So we need to find sort of a custodian solution. We need to make sure that uh, we have our ducks in a row in terms of the financing. So we have onshore funds, offshore funds, all kinds of legal that sort of had to sort of all address this. And the reason I got excited about DeFi is when I was speaking to my co-founder at the time, uh, Olivier uh, Rossi Newton, I co-founded Hive, it's like if I had to do SecFi all over again, there would be so many different instances where I could actually leverage DeFi or 
or a smart contract to, to make that entire process more, more efficient. So I don't think it's a winner takes all market. I think we will, you know, I'm also very excited to see, you know, applications that will live a little bit on the edge of centralized finance and DeFi, because sometimes you, it, it, you still require some kind of authority, even in decentralized applications that, you know, that, that brings some governance to the table effectively. And I think, um, yeah, that's where we see, we'll see a lot of innovation happening for sure. Yeah. So let's talk about uh, DeFi technologies. I'm an advisor to uh, the company. Uh, you and Olivier came together uh, and started this. Let's talk about just the impetus for the idea, right? You're at SecFi. Uh, you guys decide that you're going to do this. What is the um, uh, kind of original idea? What, why do it? So when Olivier started Hive four years ago, um, he had a very simple uh, sort of thesis of why this company would work. You know, now we can go on Coinbase, which went public today and probably see a very uh, amazing debut where people can pretty easily buy Bitcoin. If you look four years ago, there's people still scrambling, where do I go? Which part is, do I trust? There was a, still a lot of hacks at the time. Now a lot of these platforms have matured. But what he, in the end, and this is the genius behind what he did with Hive, he said to people, okay, look, you want to get exposure to crypto, exposure to Bitcoin, Ethereum, just buy my stock. Now we're in an environment where we've had Bitcoin, we've had Ethereum smart contracts, we had a little bit of the ICO crage, uh, cra craziness that had that happened. But now we have an evolution of technologies that you know um, are all around DeFi and have all these new sort of opportunities with them. Whether you're talking about yield farming, staking, liquidity pools, etc., um, that have all been developed. But increasingly complicated. Like I have a computer science degree. It take me it takes even me a long time to make some of these trades. So coming back to what Olivier did, what DeFi technologies really is, is like, look, you want to get exposure to DeFi in a deep diversified fashion, just buy our stock. So we're giving retail investors basically exposure and also institutions to what I think is the next wave of financial innovation that is happening um, and bringing that to the public markets. For sure. And walk through a little bit in terms of just the way that you get uh, a company like this into the public market uh, and then how you capitalize it. Yeah. So we, um, so, so the, the way that we sort of got it into the market is we started DeFi as a, as a private company and we found like a really good uh, public company to, uh, to work with in the Canadian market. So we, we kind of like uh, took, took over that company um, uh, with, with, our, uh, with our company DeFi Holdings and then effectively did an uplisting to the NEO, which is a tier one exchange uh, in Canada and has a, has a sort of superior uh, corporate governance, where, especially if you want to sort of attract um, institutions. And, and how you capitalize it is we, we really focused on, you know, we have had a couple of different assets already that we that we know we wanted to build out. So one of them is uh, we have an ETN business, you know, where we create, a, uh, where we basically allow people to, to, to buy uh, exposure to DeFi in, in their brokerage accounts. You know, just like you have uh, Grayscale Bitcoin Trust and Ethereum Trust, we effectively have now uh, developed uh, the first uh, Bitcoin Zero, Ethereum Zero coming out with some of the... Um, some of the protocols that uh, that are on DeFi, such as Aave, Synthetic, Curve, and etc. And for that, of course, you need you need you need capital to sort of run that. So we did a private placement uh, in 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 the quarter one of this year of a ten million dollar Canadian, and we'll expect to sort of uh, you know capitalize the bigger business going forward as well. For sure. And as you kind of think through this, uh, this is a whole new sector, right? I think a lot of people don't understand that right. uh, just because you understand Correct. finance doesn't mean you necessarily understand decentralized finance and a lot of what's happening right. there. Uh, talk to us about just what you're seeing kind of on the ground and in the trenches, right? So uh, there's lots of activity, people are really excited, but what are you actually seeing being built and where is the adoption occurring of uh, these products? Yeah, I think I think a really big adoption. Also, when I just empirically, like if I just look at my network and stuff and how people sort of transact, you see a real, really big adoption happening. For example, on stable coins, right? So you have, of course, we have USDC, we have USDT, but you also have new protocols such as Frax, which are sort of more sort of algorithmic stable coins. And you just see now that those things are becoming more stable. The SEC uh, came out with some um, uh, with some really positive guidance around stable coins. You, you see that people are now increasingly more just accepting that they can wire USDC to each other rather than making a bank wire. And I think that that frictionless payment sort of system, system that is happening on the blockchain, I think that's one of the things I am super um, uh, excited about. And where you see a lot of, I think, um, you know, good innovation happening is, for example, the price discovery on Coinbase that is happening uh, was already public on FTX, for example, right? So... 
Coinbase shares were already traded, I think, for about three to three to six months on, on for example, FTX, where uh, people were, were, you know, doing price discovery. And it seems to be pretty close to where it's going to open open today. I think other areas where we see a lot of like uh, innovation, of course, happening is is in a, is, is one of the key use cases is lending. Right. So we have anywhere from Aave to Curve. Uh, there's there there's a lot of stuff um, uh, stuff happening there, and it's it's kind of very interesting to follow sort of where that um, where that will go. But these are kind of the three sort of main areas that I that I that I'm tracking and that sort of I'm following and I'm, I'm excited about. For sure. And so when you think about the team, walk us through kind of who makes up the team today, and then how you guys are thinking about adding people in the future. Yeah, we have um we have a pretty distributed diverse team. So um, uh, maybe just talking around like what what we do. So. So we have, of course, our, our um, ETN business. So we acquired an asset that uh, Olivia and I also built the last three years uh, called Valor Structured Products. We have um, we have an amazing CEO in place there called uh, called Diana Bix, who used to uh, uh, head up uh, HSBC uh, Innovation and uh, also their their sort of crypto crypto division and a lot of the um, the, the things that uh, HSBC did in that market. So she is she's running that business for us uh, together with uh, Johan Buttonstrom, which is the one of the founders of CoinShares, which also went public uh, recently. So has the wealth of knowledge on the, on the, on the kind of the trading side. We have another trading desk in uh, Zug, Switzerland, um, where we where most of our trading happens. Some some, some seasoned professionals from uh, from UBS and the likes, and um, uh, and, and who, who sort of oversee that business. Then on our, our venture side, so as you may have seen, we invested of course in Sovereign, which uh, we're super happy to uh, sort of join. And we have a, an entire team in um, uh, in um, on the West Coast that kind of sources all those deals, and that's really great, right? Because for public markets investors, especially retail investors, they're just not going to have exposure to this kind of type of deal flow, right? You know, you also know probably it's really concentrated in the one percent of the one percent that kind of sees the best deals and is able to evaluate them. And we do that for users, uh, for our customers, so that you know we provide them early access to this uh, to this. And then we have, uh, you know, of course, my co-founder Olivier Rossi Newton, uh, who is uh, who founded Hive Blockchain Technologies, is one of the most traded companies in uh, in Canada, uh, pretty much every day, one of the most liquid. Uh, so he has a lot of wealth uh, wealth of experience in kind of the Canadian capital markets and kind of also growing a public company. And uh, that's kind of the sort of I would say like the main um, the main team. Uh, and then we have. Have also uh, an amazing guy, um, Curtis, on board who does all of our marketing and kind of uh, helps to sort of build the brand. And you know, we just launch a new website and 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 oversees all of that. So that's uh, that's kind of like how everything comes together. And then you ask about hiring. Yeah, we're definitely looking to hire on the ETM business. You know, so if I can pluck that, I will pluck that any day. You know, traders or or on the tech side always need help there. So so that's kind of where we're really looking to expand coming up. Coming few months, <laughs> for sure. And so, talk a little bit about um, this idea of hey, there's one stock uh, somebody can buy and they can get exposure to kind of uh, multiple uh, businesses within this uh, kind of subsector, really, of uh, the crypto industry. Right. Um, when you talk to investors, what's kind of the pros of having that single stock to buy, and then what are the risks or the downside? Yeah, I think the the pros I would really compare it to like investing in Coinbase, right? So if you're investing in Coinbase. Uh, even though, of course, we're not a hundred billion dollar market cap company yet, uh, but if you could just compare it on sort of the investment thesis, is you know Coinbase will make money whether it's really Bitcoin that's going up or whether it's Aave or something else. They they just if you invest in Coinbase, you're probably taking a long term uh, a long term long position on actually where crypto is going and how that company is performing. So I think for for investors, we're really good in in that kind of concept, right? It, 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 whether people buy our ETNs in Aave or in, in synthetics or in curve or or any kind of other it doesn't really matter like we make money of course on on kind of the products that we offer and same thing goes for some for the other products that i mentioned before so that's really the advantage that you can take a more sort of diversified view and that's really good for people that don't want to that don't fully understand maybe like what kind of uh exposure to buy in DeFi. um and the downside is of course is that you probably, if you really understand, let's say, Frax, or you really understand uh, Synthetics or Aave, um, and you know, you could, of course, have superior returns by simply buying that one, you know, uh, uh, that one token or that one protocol that you that you really like. So that's kind of one of the downsides, right? A more diversified approach also means that you have, you know, a, a sort of dampened um, uh, return on some of the the outliers. Uh, that's kind of like uh, what I would say. 
Yeah, it makes a, a ton of sense. It also, I think part of this like holding company strategy, if you if uh, I, I can call it that, is uh, you get both investments plus operating businesses as well, right? And I think that's right. part of, yeah. uh, you know, I first started talking to you guys about it. What becomes really interesting uh, for somebody like me is like, one, I get to learn a bunch that's going on. Uh, but two is you have the, uh, the direct capital exposure, uh, but also even in a bull or bear market, you've got these operating businesses that uh, that should perform exactly. well as well. And so it's a, it's are kind yeah. of a very unique, uh, unique structure. Um, let's talk a little bit about NFTs. It seems like everyone is talking about that every day right now. Uh, what are you guys doing there? What are you personally interested in? Um, and then kind of how do you see that industry as it continues to evolve? Yeah, so so personally, like I'm super bullish on the entire space. I think that um, when you when you look at, uh, so I'm, uh, I'm actually by, uh, you know, when I was 16, I was actually a professional, uh, professional gamer. And I still remember that, you know, you have, you know, what always made the rounds is like who had the coolest wallpapers, right? And it's always being showed around. And there's all these uh, people that do the animes. And, and there's a real market for these type of digital assets. And I think it is beyond what people believe there to exist, right? There, I think there, that market is actually bigger than people that people think. But there, you know, up until now, there's not really a way to, you know, reward these, reward these creators, right? We've also seen the entire sort of meme wave where there is a real, there's a real like want of people. Like I want to have that meme because that's the coolest meme. And there's this entire community, which I think people are overlooking that, that creates value. And this is not really so different if you compare it to maybe, uh, and I mean that not without disrespect, uh, with, with, with disrespect or something, old money that wants to have this Van Gogh in their house, you know, or wants to have a certain Monet or something else. It's just a different way of doing things and a new sort of the new uh, millennials and stuff, the new generation is much more, you know, open to how art is being created. And I think that is a fluid concept. So from that perspective, I'm super bullish on the industry. I think it will have this natural, this is a market that will naturally have its like sort of ups and then it will, people will kind of see where it settles. I think that will definitely happen. Like I tried to, you know, I tried to be funny and try to buy an NFT for a friend of mine and I couldn't find something under like $1,800 or something. So, and so that was kind of something that I cut very short. Um, and, and it's something from a DeFi perspective that we're looking at as well. So we're, we're not really in the, in the, in the business of, of trading, you know, these NFTs. I don't think that's our expertise, but we, we would be looking at like interesting assets that we can, you know, potentially collaborate with fund, uh, take a minority or majority position in, uh, in order to, you know, grow the sort of, um, uh, yeah, exposure that we can give our users to what is, what is essentially also a decentralized uh, market. So yeah, that's how we're looking at it. Got it. And so when you start thinking about, uh, let's take NFTs as an example, it seems like it's a very global market, right? This is not just a Western yep. finance market. Um, talk a little bit about just what you're seeing across the globe. If there's specific, um, you know, maybe geographies that you're really excited about, or if there's conversations that you've had with people around the world, uh, any kind of learnings or takeaways uh, for people um, on that like kind of global perspective? Well, what I think, what I think is, um, uh, what I think is interesting from a global perspective is that you know I'm a big fan of uh, you know some some uh, a few Japanese artists, for example. And if I want to buy, you know, on Artsy, for example, I, I've been looking for a really long time for specific you know pieces of art that I would like to to buy from this artist. And they are like they're they're prints, you know, but there's a limited edition prints. And where I'm going with this is that a lot of these prints are being sold in China. Um, you know, and, and the, the thing is there, you don't really know, like, if it's real, you know, or if it's maybe a counterfeit, or there's a lot of things happening there. And I think what makes it so interesting from a global perspective is that NFT can really bring with it sort of a provenance uh, for those who don't know it, that you can kind of like trace, you know, the, from, from who it owns today, all the way back to its owner. So in a, in a traditional painting, you, you could all go in a Van Gogh, you could go to like the museum that currently holds it all the way to when Van Gogh actually painted it, for example, that needs to be there. Otherwise your, you know, your painting is not considered real or, or genuine in, in most cases. And what is interesting, you know, for the NFTs is that I can just trace what the provenance is. I can see it on the blockchain. So from a global perspective, I think it really broadens your mind in terms of like buying, you know, NFT art from, for example, China or Japan, or, you know, French art that is owned by a Chinese person uh, where you may consider like it might be fraud in a traditional world, but now I can actually trace it and look at it. So I think that makes this world of art much more global and much more interesting and inclusive. That's why I'm yeah. on it. 
Yeah, no, I, I think that makes a ton of sense. And so um, let's go back to this idea of uh, there's a new world and in kind of an old world, right? And those aren't necessarily right. uh, completely descriptive, but we'll use them just for the conversation. Um, and so if we start thinking about like the analog legacy world, it seems like some of those organizations have woken up, right? The reason why Goldman Sachs has been around for a century right. yeah, yeah. is because they've mm-hmm. navigated every technology trend as it's uh, popped up and become a threat and they figure out how to, how to kind of do it. Are there specific things that you think in DeFi uh, regardless of where it's being built, that will naturally be the first entry points for some of these legacy organizations? Is it decentralized lending? Is it, no, they're just going to go trade on decentralized exchanges? Like, How do you think they uh, kind of interface with a lot of this new technology first? Yeah, it's it's a very good question. And I think, you know, organizations such as you mentioned, like Goldman Sachs and stuff. And, and this is a, this is not really based on my conversation with Goldman or any of these institutions. But if I, if I were to look at this, I would probably look at okay, what are my operational processes in my own business and how can I make those more efficient, right? So for example, um, you know, Ripple, maybe to use them as an example, like in the backend and some of these processes, whether it's Visa or MasterCard or some of the others that they have in kind of their, you know, um, uh, sort of network, if you will, they're already using what is essentially blockchain technology to make their own internal processes either more efficient or more transparent or just safer, right? Because everything is, is sort of... Um, uh, 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 built on the blockchain. So I think where you see the, you know, sort of low hanging fruit, it's probably going to be those solutions. I think if you look at really like decentralized lending, um, I think institutions will, will need some time in order to really become the major liquidity providers. I think currently it's still like high net worth, maybe family offices at the maximum that is kind of in the space. It's a lot of in- individuals. I think we'll, you know, there's the stuff that needs to be answered around also KYC, right? Who is the other party, AML? And I think there's a lot of interesting things happening there. For example, with Shift Network, where, where we invested, that is kind of, kind of addressing some of these things um, uh, before there, we would see real adoption there. But that's kind of like how I see maybe some of the paths there to, 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 to adoption in a, in a more traditional sense. Yeah. And what's so fascinating to me is that the conversation and question around, like, do we need the legacy institutions, right? If the legacy institutions never come in, right. uh, can, sure. can this be successful and, and can it kind of stand on its own without any of their support or participation? Yeah, I think, uh, it, again, it's it's like, it's like um, you know, it's again, where is sort of the, the real future and what's sort of the middle, you know, where are we, where are we today? And I think, you know, DeFi went, of course, from about 500 million two years ago to now $52 billion market cap. But the same thing is, is like, which is amazing if, you know, that's your market cap of maybe uh, Uber when it went public or something. But if you look at the global financial market, I mean, we're talking about a different animal, right? We're talking about trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars. If you just look at the, you know, the US, their stimulus, uh, latest stimulus package, that's 1.9 billion, but it's still like a drop in the water if you look at like what the global financial system is. So the answer there is kind of like, will we need those institutions? Well, those institutions are funded typically also a lot by, by LPs that will have their own cash, right? So maybe it's, it's part of the institutions, maybe part of LP money that will kind of move into this space. But yeah, I do think you need the big, you know, some of the big institutions to also come in. And then we're not talking about 52 billion anymore, which could be a single fund, right? We're looking at about multiples of that and, and seeing that grow like that. And For then DeFi sure. needs liquidity, right? That's where a lot of the yield is coming from at the moment. So there's lots of opportunity there. Yeah. One of the most interesting aspects of just all the on-chain applications is uh, this whole idea of the transparency of data, right? And the fact that, uh, you know, Coinbase versus, let's say, Uniswap. Uh, Coinbase, we all wait for the financial uh, um, kind of reveal, right? We wait for the conference call. Uh, We're (laughs) all trying to figure out, you know, what are they doing? And we basically get this periodic check-in on a quarterly basis. But with a decentralized exchange, we get to see it every day, minute by minute, and we know exactly what's going on. And so it's like, That's right. as, as an investor, which one is actually better? Well, I would love the real-time data rather than the kind of static periodic data. And so it just feels like, um, you know, some of the centralized companies aren't ever going to be able to get there just because the way that they're built. But the new yep. kind of era or the new industry uh, is going to eventually become the default and the standard. That's right. And even if you look at today, right, I mean, Coinbase, I mean, the markets were open, I think, 9, 9.30 a.m. Um, you know, Coinbase is, is, you know, supposed to be public, right? But it, it's still at 250, at least before I, I checked before the call. 
And that's because it takes some time for these systems to work and the sheriffs to list. And, you know, which, and it's, it's, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it, the system works. But if you look at like, you know, let's say that uh, you want to list, uh, you know, you want to list sovereign, you know, which is what we did today, you can do that probably on FTX and it will, be, it will be listed like, you know, the next second, right? If you, you prepare it properly. So I think, you know, there's a real, and, and that's, I think, what people love in the end. And that's what people get also sometimes, I wouldn't say addicted, but they get addicted to the sort of screens and like playing with the, it, it's, it is um it's creating a lot of value for people and, and the information is very helpful for people to uh yeah to, to kind of trade and, and make up their own minds and so that's i uh, definitely agree with that yeah i uh, i think it's absolutely fascinating and you can see people obviously trading is one thing uh but also it just feels like um you know when you have more information people come with all kinds of crazy stuff to uh to participate in the last thing i want to talk yeah. about before uh, we get into the rapid fire questions is uh virtual worlds and so uh it seems like this is tangentially related uh to a lot of the decentralized financial applications that are being built uh but there's concepts like uh identity and pseudonymity uh there's things like hey i'm gonna go and hang out in the metaverse with my avatar, uh, anything there that you guys are seeing that has kind of caught your eye or that you're paying attention to, uh, or is it something that you think while well, tangentially related is just completely outside of the circle of competence. And so you guys focus more on the financial applications. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, 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 it's definitely interesting. And also, you know, I have, like I said, I was a gamer before I've lived most of my teenage years, you know, in a virtual world, whether it's world of Warcraft or some of the other things that have played out there. So to that extent, I can completely relate and see the market there. I think it's less something that we focus on in DeFi, but you do see, for example, um, you just give you one example, an investment we made is in, for example, maps, right? Which is kind of trying to bridge like where I am right now in the world. So it's not really a virtual world, but it's, you know, it's giving you all kinds of information of where you are at the moment and trying to, you know, lay, layer on top of that, like augmented reality and those kind of things, but also now DeFi. So they're launching like, for example, um, uh, DeFi applications within Maps. So depending on where you are, it will offer you decentralized applications that you can interact with. So I think that's a really interesting bridge, like a pure virtual. Like when you look at like Second Life or like uh, don't, those kind of things, we haven't. I haven't really seen. But yeah, if it if you know if it comes your way, Anthony, we'd always you know look at it, of course, <laughs> to see if it, it's really interesting for DeFi technologies for sure. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, all right, uh, what is the number one thing that you've learned? What's your biggest takeaway or lesson over the last couple of months? Months as you guys have gotten this up running and, uh, and started to uh, scale it? Yeah, I think that the biggest thing is, um, you know, I always learn about how little I know uh, about DeFi and how, mu how much of a road they're still ahead. And it's just about like, you know, for me also, I try to learn and I, we, I try a lot of the strategies that my traders recommend. I try them personally and I do them you know, through Uniswap and, and, you know, through some of these other platforms. And I think we're just so at the forefront of, uh, you know, uh, you know, I, I think me sort of fully understanding it and then sort of getting on that, on that learning curve. And I think there's so, so much still, still ahead and the, the developments go so fast, so quickly um, that I think that's, what's really exciting. And that makes, that makes it also an intellectual challenge for me. So I am, I'm very uh, much driven by intellectual challenges. And I think DeFi is offering that just like SecFi gave me an intellectual challenge of like, how can I lend against private assets that, you know, that, that I cannot value on a day by day in, intra market trading ba basis? Like, how do I do that? And I think the, the DeFi has the same sort of interesting sort of steep learning curve that I'm fascinated by and that I'm still learning about every day. Yeah, I love it. It makes uh, makes a ton of sense. Uh, I got three questions, rapid fire, and then you'll get to ask me one to wrap us up. Uh, the first is, what is the most important book that you've ever read? Wow, that's a very, that's a very good question. So I am like, I am not really like a book reader, but I read a lot. I am um, I'm a massive fan of documentaries, and there is uh, there is a documentary on uh, on Masterclass actually. Uh, which is one of the best that it's by a, it's a Canadian astronaut uh, that talks about like what it takes to get into space. And what he really taught me is that like in space and in space travel, nothing is done by chance. So he's never nervous. And he, he goes and explains like why that's the case is because every, every single outcome they have sort of predefined and they know about, and they have sort of, um, they, they've thought about, and he's done it in his head. And what makes me so fascinating is about how calm he can be and how, sort of a, a methodological he can be about his, like his thinking process and how he does that. And I take a lot of learnings, learning from that also when you have complicated problems in, you know, in business or whether it's like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a computer science major when it's, whether it's about like programming sort of problems, 
to really think, apply that methodology to kind of uh, see how you can get to an answer. And that's one of the most fascinating like series that I've seen in a, in a very long time. Yeah, I haven't seen that. I'll have to watch it. It sounds very, very interesting. Uh, and I love that uh, you like documentaries because I'm the uh, the same way. I was just watching uh, White <laughs> White Boy Rick on uh, on Netflix, which is the whole uh, Detroit drug dealer that maybe uh, wasn't as big of a deal as they thought he was. Uh, okay. Second question <laughs> <There you> go. <laughs> comes from our friends over at uh, Eight Sleep. Uh, they've got this thermoregulated bed, and uh, essentially, uh, I sleep on like an ice cube. And I used to sleep like six, seven hours, or really five or six hours, uh, and now sleep like eight hours a night. Uh, completely changed my life and, and uh, makes me much more well rested. What's your sleep schedule? How much do you sleep? How has that changed over the years? So my, my sleep schedule is just terrible. So I have this, I have this brain that I can't shut off. So when I, when I go to bed, the reason I watch so many documentaries is I look for those that, uh, you know, and it's like David Attenborough or Brian Cox or like some of these more intellectual sort of stimulating documentaries, because at some point they'll make me go to sleep. Um, and I've actually, it's, it's funny you mentioned this because a friend of mine actually recommended something the same. He has like this sort of, it's like a water bed or it's something that, that makes it cooler that apparently makes you sleep better. Um, so that's, that's, and he's apparently, uh, for my birthday, which is tomorrow, he's apparently sending me one of those, uh, one of those to, to my hotel. So we'll see. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. All right. Well, you I'll, let, I'll us let you know on our next episode. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, last question is aliens. Are you a believer or a non-believer? That's a very good question. So I think if aliens is, a, is around like extraterrestrial life, right? I think you have like what is called like, uh, it's called the Drax equation or something like that, uh, which sort of calculates the probability of there to be, you know, extraterrestrial life. And for me, it's very hard to think that there's nothing out there, you know, especially most of my documentaries are about space, right? Um, so, so just mathematically, it's very hard to think that there's nothing there. But the problem is, is it, the, the mathematical probability that we haven't found anything uh, is also not really helping us, right? We should have by now maybe found, found something. So there, there's this constant, you know, it's not going to be a complete answer to your question, but there's constant two voices in my head where one says, you know, there's nothing, but the other says, but there must be something. And I'm still struggling to see which one you know, which one is going to win. It might require See, some more hours of documentaries. <laughs> uh, well, I'm in the camp of like, it's there. We just aren't going to come in contact because it's too far away. Right. right. It, it's like, like the galaxy is just so big and the technology that we have, it, it just is nearly impossible uh, to go ahead yep. and, uh, and come in contact. So we'll see. Yep. Uh, what, uh, what one question you have for me? Well, I think the, the, the one question I, I would have for you is, you know, you, you see DeFi, right? And I'm going to stick it to sort of DeFi. You see so many of these different areas developing, right? So we, we at DeFi, we, we, DeFi technologies, rather, we track, of course, prediction markets like lending, stable coins and stuff. And you asked me that question kind of where I see that market. But I, I would be interested to get your perspective. Like, where do you really see uh, the applications developing, right? So really, like adoption from users right because there's one thing about like sort of a token going up because there's price dynamics and etc but where do you really uh, get most excited about real sort of DeFi adoption when we look at real world applications yeah i mean look i think that uh every single thing that is analog uh is going to become digital right the digital versions will be bigger than the analog and i also think all the decentralized versions of these products should be bigger than the centralized versions and so uh it's pretty incredible when you start to think about um you know just right. kind of where where uh the world is headed is like digital decentralized products end up being the most valuable things and so uh obviously the decentralized financial applications are going to accrue tons of value and so um you know i'm probably less uh, tribal about like where do they get built, right? If you kind of think sure. about uh, sovereign being built on Bitcoin, if you think about like a Uniswap or uh, Ave or whatever being built elsewhere, like it, it just ends up being this really interesting thing of like I think the the technology community is arguing over uh, and debating yeah. where exactly this stuff all happens. But to the average user, like they're never going to know or care, right? Like they yeah. in right. the final version. It's just going to be, hey, does this work or not? Can I do what I want to do or not? Um, and yep. so I tend to spend more time thinking about that more so than like, you know, what's the transaction speed of a specific uh, blockchain or anything like that. Right. And maybe the one follow up question, if I may, is then because you have this natural thing where where I'm still struggling to see how it will evolve. Like, let's say, for example, you need a mortgage for your house, right? A house is not something we can ever make digital. Right. But do you do you foresee that we you know that that eventually will also happen in a decentralized fashion? Or do you think we are far away from those kind of like 
bridges between a you know centralized world effectively and a decentralized world how do you how do you see that uh, kind of time frame I think that uh, decentralization is going to be the default. Um, and so there will be bridges. There will be kind of this transition over time. Uh, I don't think that you kill the centralized version uh, in totality, right? Like it will sure. still exist yeah. um, and there'll be kind of this coexistence. But I do think that uh, it's almost like a weighing machine. Right now it's like mm-hmm. you know 99% in, uh, importance and adoption of centralization and 1% decentralization. Eventually that'll go right. to like 80-20, then 50-50, then it'll flip and it'll go you know 75-20. Uh, 25, yeah. and then maybe at some point it gets to like 90, 10, right? In favor right. of decentralization sure, sure. versus centralization. Uh, but I think that just, you know, the world's not black and white. It's much more gray. And that's kind of how we're, uh, we're transitioning here. Yeah, no, I would, I would agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Where can we send people to find you on the internet or find out more about DeFi technologies? Yeah, we just launched our, uh, our, our new website. Uh, it was completely cleaned up and, uh, and kind of uh, up to date. So it's DeFi.tech. Um, so it's very easy, uh, easy domain name. So that's kind of where you can find more. And then uh, we have a we have a ticker uh, on the Neo Exchange in Canada, um, uh, which is just a ticker DeFi. Um, so that's uh, that's really easy. And in the US, we're on the OTC as RDNAF. If people uh, want to look for it, so those are the two main. I think for your audience, is the two main tickers: uh, DeFi uh, on the Neo and an RDNAF on the OTC in the US. Awesome, man. You guys do a fantastic job. I'm, uh, I'm excited to, uh, to be along with the ride. Uh, Glad and, to have you uh, we'll have, and we will uh, we'll have to continue to, uh, to talk as, uh, as you guys continue to build business. Awesome. Thanks for having me, uh, Anthony.